I'm Howie Rose, and welcome to a very special edition of One on One as I chat with the greatest left-handed pitcher in the history of the New York Mets, Jerry Kuzman. It is always so great to see you in New York, particularly with all of the festivities for the 1969 World Champion Mets. Is it still special after all these years when you reunite? You know, you come to New York and everybody comes up and talks about it. I was five years old then. I was just in uh, freshman in high school or ninth grade. And they bring up certain instances that happened during that season and the World Series. So it stays fresh in your mind. No matter where you go, you're remembered for, I mean, 50 years. They still remember it like yesterday. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's always special. If you walk around the streets of New York now, and you're not wearing any Mets paraphernalia or there's nothing to indicate that this is Jerry Kuzman. Do people still recognize you? No, not much. There, once in a while. But uh, not like it was back then. Then everybody did. But now, uh, thank God, we're getting a little more privacy. Well, Jerry Kuzman was not only the winningest left-handed pitcher in the history of the New York Mets, he was, and I don't think you'd get any blowback about this from anybody, the best money pitcher that this organization has ever had. Why? What was it that enabled you to step above and beyond the moment? Well, um, there was a, probably a few things, but probably number one was I feared losing. I, I didn't want to be looked upon as a loser by anyone. And uh, I always feared losing. Um, the other things that come into play would be the pressure of expectation from the fans, the ball club, the ownership, the media. There's just, I mean, they're writing all the things that can happen, you know. And so some of that expectation enters your mind and it just, there's so much pressure on you that you can't lose and you, we didn't want to go back to Baltimore. So, yeah, it was, and I, I, I loved it. I, uh, yeah, I'm nervous first inning, then I settled down, I was myself, till the ninth inning, and then um, the fans were just so loud. You couldn't hear yourself think. So, and I remember my warm-up pitches and started the ninth inning and I couldn't get my curveball over. It was that excitement set in and nervousness, you don't want to blow it, and et cetera. And uh, so I just said, well, I'm not going to throw the curveball. There's no sense in throwing it if you can't get it over. So all I threw was fastballs that ninth inning and get two outs. And Davey Johnson hits that fly ball to left field. Well, you can't hear the ball hit the bat, where normally that's part of our judgment and how well the ball's hit. Well, he hits fly ball. I don't know if he hit it good or not, or if it's going out of the park. And I turn around and look at Cleon. I see Cleon going back, and oh, the first thing is heart stops. Mm -hmm. Well, then you see him slow down. Well, God, now you know it's okay. Now the only other thing is don't drop the ball. <laughs> and that was the last thing I said, Cleon, don't drop the ball, squeeze it. Now, the fans got out on the field real fast, and it was the most jubilant moment to this date and probably forever in the history of the Mets franchise. I just don't think anything can ever top 1969 for a whole lot of reasons. But in the ensuing 50 years, when you go to bed, maybe think about that moment, that game. Do you almost wish that you had a little extra time on the field to celebrate instead of running for your lives? Never thought about it that way. The fans are all coming out in the field. Well, now you kind of fear for your life because some <laughs> of them could have been Oriole fans. You know, you don't know what's going to happen. You know, they're going to try to steal your glove, your cap, or whatever they can get a hold of. But uh, so then our main thing was get off the field. And uh, by then they were coming over the top of the dugout and falling on each other and they were probably laying two, three deep in the dugout. And I remember just walking over the top of a few of them just getting down the stairs and getting out of there. I want to play a little mental telepathy for a minute because, you know, again, Jerry was the big game pitcher of all time for the Mets and you had to build up to that. But I'm going to think of a sequence, not necessarily a pitcher or a batter, but a, a sequence that came to define you as a pitcher. If you had to guess what that was, what would it be? On the mound yeah. or uh -huh. approaching no, a game? Mound, or? In a game, on the mound. A sequence. Um, have, not a sequence necessarily to one batter, but just something that came to define you early in your career. 
Let's see if I the same I, wavelength. I wasn't the same throughout my whole career. There was, you know, some minor injuries I had. I had to make adjustments. Sometimes it took longer to heal and get back to your get your fastball back. Sometimes you had a good curveball, sometimes you didn't. You had to know what was working for you that day. And when I had everything working for me, for instance, winning my 20th game against St. Louis here, I had a great concentration. I had pinpoint control with my fastball, and I had the best curveball I ever had in my life. And I really concentrated on following, pulling through on that thing. Well, my challenge that night was to throw the pitch they're looking for and prove them they still can't hit it. <laughs> and that's what I did that night. And that was my fun in that game. I struck out 13, mm -hmm. but I threw the pitch that uh, they were looking for. And still and the, beat them with and it. And still beat them with it. See, that was, thinking, was my thrill of that. I was thinking of something else because it came very early in your career. And most of us who remember the home opener in 1968 against the Giants, Mets had never won any kind of an opening day to that point. Not the regular season, not the home season. No opening day had been won by the Mets. They come home. They'd already opened on the road. But now you're facing the Giants. And they load the bases. And most people really weren't very familiar with Jerry Kuzman. He was a rookie. April, whatever it was, of his rookie year. So now you're facing the Giants, and they've got the bases loaded, and nobody out. And that's got to be a pretty daunting situation to be in when you're, a, when you're a rookie. How clearly do you remember what happened next? Very well. I'll just reiterate a little bit. Tito Fuentes led off with a single. Jim Davenport got on in an air. I walked Willie McCovey, and here we are, first inning. Standing, there's the Shea Stadium seated, what, 55,300? 55, and, and they said there was only, there's standing room only there. There was. And I went, oh my God, I'm thinking, and now Willie Mays is coming up to hit. And I'm thinking, what in the hell am I doing here? I'd rather be in a tractor home <laughs> plowing the field or something. Well, I remembered also that uh, Clyde McCullough in 66 told me whenever you're in trouble, just reach back for number one. Well, I knew Willie Mays. I'd figured out what his weaknesses were. He was a guest hitter, but I couldn't take that chance in that situation. So I just choo, 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 struck him out fastballs, and uh, Jim Ray Hart was uh, next and popped him up to Jerry Grody, and Jack Hyatt was the next hitter and struck him out, and we went on to win three to nothing. So that is to a lot of people what signaled your arrival your calling card, but now 51 years after that, I gotta ask you something, because you just said it. So 1968, you're what, about 25, 24, 25, 20, whatever? I have to do my math. 16, <laughs> well, whatever was, it is, you're young. Yeah, about 25. And you're inexperienced, and yeah. you just said, you had Willie Mays all figured out. At that age, for that at bat, how'd that happen? What did you see in Willie that told you what you could Willie do? Willie Mays was a hero of mine. I, I mean, I idolized him. And uh, the year before, or was it 68? Maybe it was 68. Uh, we uh, finished spring training uh, exhibition games in Palm Springs, Arizona, or California. Mm -hmm. And we were playing the Giants. Well, I'm pitching against them. And so, uh, and I, Willie Mays comes to play. Now, this is the first time I've ever facing him. And I was just saying to myself, you know, how lucky can you be? to face the, the idol in your dreams, you know, your hero. So, and I studied him. I watched every little move he made and I watched where he put his feet on the plate and how his toes lined up compared to where I was standing. And uh, boom, threw him a fastball, whoa, just missed it. Holy Christ, says he's looking for the fastball. I looked pretty soon, now I see his feet. He had opened up his stance a little bit, maybe only about an inch. Well, I threw a curveball, boom, just fouled it off again. Knew exactly what is, that's what he's looking for. I said, damn, a little red light goes off up here. I see by his feet, he's a guest hitter. So now I just watched his feet. I told Grody about it. Grody couldn't see it from his, too close to him. He couldn't see that little minute movement with his front foot. But I could for the mound. So I said, okay, I'll just call the pitches for when I'm playing a pitch against Willie. So after that, I just bet on how he set up in the, to hit. I threw the opposite. And I remember uh, some years later, 
uh, Jack Lang asked me, how did you do against uh, you know, some of the big hitters like Willie Mays and Hank Aaron and Willie Sarge? I said, I didn't have any problem with him. I said, no, oh, he wouldn't believe that. So he went and looked it up. Well, Mays hit, I think, like 120 off of me. Aaron made 140. Really? Star Joe was in the hundreds. Bench, same thing. I got the big hitters out as the Judys that hit the ball all over right. the field that were uh, did the most damage. And certainly a lot of good athletes there, too. Yeah. Well, there, there's another pitch, I guess, that Met fans will remember forever because of what it represented. Famous game, Monday night against the Cubs. You're two and a half behind them. You're going this way, they're going that way. And Bill Hands knocks A.G. down in the bottom of the first inning. Later, Tommy would hit a home run, get the hit that, uh, you know, drove home what proved to be the winning run. But then the top of the second comes, and you didn't waste any time going at one of their best hitters, Ron Santo. Did you knew, or did you know as soon as A.G. hit the deck that you had to do something? Yeah. Yeah, um, I would always protect my hitters. It didn't happen much then where people threw at our hitters. It maybe was an accident. You can tell if it's an accident or on purpose pitch. But this was on purpose pitch. I think he threw him twice, knocked him down. And so he's really sending a message there. So I always said, you screw with one of my hitters, I'm going after your best hitter. I ain't going to fool around with that eighth, ninth place hitter. Well, it so happened, I got him out one, two, three in the top of the first. Top of the second, cleanup hitter, Ron Santos up. Don't waste no time. Boom. I th felt kind of bad because I thought it broke his arm. But uh, then after a while, he stayed in the game. And so, but anyway, it ended. Any um, discussion about that with Santo over the ensuing years? I was on a plane with Santo. I don't know where we were going, probably some golf tournament or something. We were up, John away, chatting away, and he says, say, Kuzi says, uh, someone told me once that you threw at me on purpose at Shea. He says, did you? I said, hell yeah, I did. He you said, couldn't have figured that out? He didn't believe it. Really? He thought it was one got away from him, me. Wow. And Ron Santo was a great guy. It was a, yeah, it was a big loss to this game when Ron Santo passed away. We stopped the clicking of the heels, too. He sure <laughs> did. And that was Ron Santo's signature move when the Cubs looked like they were pulling away in 1969. And there appeared to be a time in 1969 when uh, you weren't going to have much of a season. It was a cold night in Montreal. Did you think you were in big trouble when your shoulder went dead? I was, uh, had two out in the fifth inning. And to win a game, you got to complete five, first five innings. And um, so I was, uh, I think I was leading, maybe it was nothing, nothing, I can't remember. Or no, I was ahead, two or not three or not, something like that. John Bateman was the hitter with two out. I had two strikes on him, so I'm going to bust him inside with a good fastball. Just, you know, stay away from that outside corner of the plate. That's part of mine, you know. i to move him back a little bit. Well, my arm went numb. I threw the pitch inside, but my arm went numb. And I'm wasting time around the mound trying to pick up the rosin bag or do things to see what the heck's going on here, you know. Well, pretty soon Grody sees me wait, taking way too much time because of the fast pitcher. He comes out and says, what's going on? I said, my arm went numb. So he looks in the dugout. Of course, then Gil Hodges comes out. And Gil wasn't going to take any chances. He took me out of the game. Well, there's one game that got away from me, has one pitch away from a win. But uh, so I go in the clubhouse, and uh, the, Tom McKinnon's the trainer, and he tries to figure out, or Gus Mock was the trainer, he tried to figure out what was wrong. My arm felt good. There was no numbness there anymore. Figured, well, it was just a freak thing. Well, no, they were going to send me, fly me back to New York and see the doctor and get really checked out. So I came back to New York the next day. The doc couldn't find anything wrong. So then I flew to Chicago because the team went to Chicago in the meantime, and I joined them there, and it was my second day to throw on the side. And I go to throw, and I couldn't reach home plate. It hurt so bad. Well, now up to the training room we go again, and Johnny Murphy was still there then. And Gil Hodges, Johnny Murphy, and the trainers and tried to figure out what was wrong with me. And I'm laying on my stomach on the trainer's table, and Johnny Murphy says, you know, that kind of reminded me one time when I was pitching with the Yankees, he said, I had something like that too. But I explained that it felt more like it was up in the joint of my shoulder where the pain was. 
But he said, mine wasn't up here. Mine was here. And he stuck his finger in under my arm here like this. And, well, God, I came right off that table. It hurt so bad. Well, they found what it was is a knotted teres minor muscle. Well, now we knew what it was. It wasn't any tears or anything. Now they had to milk it out. So the trainer, every day, get in his thumbs and milk that knot out. And oh, my God, the pain for a month to get that arm going again. And finally, as well, boom, I was right back to normal. My test game, we, we had an exhibition game against Memphis, our double-A club. So it was my test game to see if I was okay. So they run me out there, and I pitched, uh, I think, seven, eight, struck out 15. They said, you're ready. yeah, you're ready. <laughs> back to work you go. Um, 1969 is something unto itself, but there was a lot more to Jerry Kuzman's career with the Mets than 1969. You talked about winning your 20th game in 1976. There was another pennant in 1973, and what happened during game five? You're playing the A's, it's two games to two, and you win that game, you go up and then go out to Oakland only needing to win one. Did pitching game five in 73 with the series tied feel every bit as pressurized as pitching game five in 69 when you were up three games to one? I don't think so. Um, naturally, it was a do or die, I mean, we had a win or else well, so you're going back down a game yeah, to Oakland. Yeah, we're going to Oakland and two games left to play. But we win that game. It wasn't, I don't think it was as pressure a game as it was, you know, in 69, the last game. Or the first game, even. But um, win that game, now we go to Oakland, leading 3-2. to two. All we do is win one more game. We knew we had the club, we could do it. I mean, yeah, we didn't shine during the season, but we sure shined in the playoffs and and playing good in the series. We go to o Oakland and there was, from what I read, I wasn't knowledgeable at the time, but what I read, there was a pitching change. Oh, there was a controversy. Yeah, there was a pitching controversy and, and Yogi pitched Seaver a day earlier mm -hmm. than he should have. Yep. And, Would uh, you have pitched Stone in six and saved Seaver on full rest for seven with Matlack backing him up? Yeah, we always went according to the rotation, the way it was. But uh, for some reason, um, Seaver moved up ahead of, in Stone's place, I guess. But the, the first game was Matlack pitching, I believe. Of the series? Was it first or last game out there? Well, he pitched, uh, in Oakland, he pitched the second game, which was game seven. On, on, okay. Yeah. Well, that game, uh, I was up in the bullpen. And I was throwing the best I'd thrown all year. I was just pinpoint control and just blowing. And I told Pig Detano, tell or Rube, tell Yogi to put me in, because Matlack was in trouble. Yeah. I put him in, I said, they won't get a run. And they didn't put me in. But I, I th actually believe that game, I could have stopped it right there. That's how well I was throwing. Well, the A's went on to win that game. And, and just a couple of things about that 73 team, too. You and, and Rusty became pretty good friends, as I recall, anyway. And that wasn't always the case. When You told a story years ago, and I forget the details now. You and Rusty had a little something going against each other, right? When he was uh, with Houston and Montreal, and, um, and you were pitching for the Mets. That uh, uh, I don't recall. He, oh, I thought I remember you I don't recall story. anything. I know Rusty robbed me of a home run in Montreal to right <laughs> really? field, back against the wall, fence. He took a home run away from me. But I had no uh, ill feelings Oh, no, not that way. Just that, Rusty. Um, but I, Ryan... Yeah. Nolan Ryan kind of had it in for Rusty. Oh, that I didn't know. Yeah, he uh, threw one at Rusty's really? head one time, and a lot of things happened there in, the, in just a moment. <laughs> well, the, but, there's a story you told for the first time 10 years ago, and here we are on the 50th anniversary now. Game five, you're pitching against the Orioles, and the famous incident where Cleon thought he was hit by a pitch by Dave McNally, tries to skip out of the way, the ball goes into the dugout, you're sitting next to Gill. Now, you told it for the first time 10 years ago. Did you really scuff the ball on Gill's orders? I did. The ball came to me, bouncing down the, the steps. I reached down to catch it. As I'm bent down, Gill says, swipe it against your shoe. Swipe it on your spike or shoe, whatever. And I did, he's handing me, giving me the ball. He's reaching for giving me the ball. I give it to him, it was all so quick. But think of the, the great head he had on his shoulders to think about it that quick. Now he takes the ball out, shows the umpire, there's shoe polish on the ball. 
Maybe it wasn't mine. Maybe it was Cleon shoe polish. Don't know. I never got to look at the ball after I swiped it on my foot. But he took a ball out there that had shoe polish on it. Now, I don't know if I hit my shoe good enough. We always, our shoes got polished every day, so it was pretty easy to get shoe polish on the ball. But uh, you'd have to ask Cleon. Did, I don't remember if Cleon said he was hit or not. But. Oh, he thought he was. Oh, Clint, okay. Well, Don Clendenin, who became a lawyer, was taking up the argument for him because Clendenin oh. was on deck. Oh. And, then, and, and then, of course, ends up hitting the home run. But well, maybe Gil just uh, kind of put an extra nail in there to make sure <laughs> he had some good evidence. Now, you were a fun-loving guy back in the day, and there are probably a lot of stories you prefer not to tell on camera, and I'm sure you've thought of a few that you can. What is your favorite story about pranks or hijinks or practical jokes that you enjoyed playing on a particular teammate that, that you can tell? Well, since we're here uh, kind of celebrating uh, Seaver's... Uh, great career. Mm -hmm. uh, one year, and I can't remember when this was, probably in the earlier 70s, I was reading a magazine by my locker and in the back there's all these little ads and they had an ad in there for a listening device and I was a big gadget guy anyway. So I ordered it and I tested it out in my house in, uh, I was living in Port Washington at the time, and the direction says if you tune your FM radio to 127.3 that's the frequency this worked on. It had a little mic on it. It was about this long and about this wide. It had a little rubber antenna on it, a little speaker on it. And uh, so I tuned it in on our stereo at this big house we were in. My wife was ironing in the kitchen. And so I put something in my mouth like uh, in The Godfather, you know, <laughs> changed my voice. And I said, I turned the volume up and I stepped back behind one another wall and I said, are you one of the everyday housewives that's burdened with the drudgeries of ironing and washing dishes and making meals and take care of three kids? And finally she stops, she goes, she looks in the next room. Well, it worked, you know. So I said, okay, so now I take it to the clubhouse. And I, during one of the games, I came in the clubhouse and I told Nick Torman, I said, take it and put it under Yogi's desk in the manager's room. And Seaver had an FM radio above his locker. I said, I'll tune it in there, and you, uh, you talk. Well, I could hear perfect. I said, well, what we do then, we'll just tape it under Yogi's desk. We can hear what they're talking about in their <laughs> meetings, closed door meetings. Well, I got to think about, no, nah, that isn't going to work. Cause they'll find out about that right away. So then I came up with this trade. And so I got Jack Simon to help me because he did a perfect imitation of He was Howard. the director, right? The TV he was director? The TV director for WORTV. A great guy, and he did a great imitation of Howard Cosell. So I came up with this trade. We just got through playing Houston earlier that year, and we had that big fight down there in Houston with Doug Rader. Oh, Doug Rader slid into Kevin Collins and knocked him out, and we had a huge brawl on the field. Well, so I came up with this trade, and I'll start now. The deal was we do this one right after batting practice when all the guys are in the clubhouse and Jack go into Doc's room, which is right there by our trainer's room, and you do a countdown from 10 to zero. 10, nine, eight. You know, give me time to get out there, get up on Seaver's stool and tune his radio, and I had turned the volume down, tune it in so I had it just zeroed right, and then I hear him go three, two, one, zero. And now when he hit zero, Give me about 10 seconds to turn the volume up and get out of there. Okay, well I turned the volume up. I get, Seaver was talking to Don Grant, the chairman of the board, right in front of his locker there, but he there wasn't on the stool I could get up there. And everybody would go change stations on there. It was a common thing. <coughs> now here it comes. Um, he started out by saying, hello everybody, this is Howard Cosell with a NBC Sports Bolton. The New York Mets have just announced a major trade today, trading right-handed pitcher Tom Seaver and left-hand hitting first baseman Ed Cranepool to Houston for third baseman Doug Rader and left-handed pitcher Ed Konezgi. Well, Ed Konezgi, he couldn't get my mother out. I mean, we just lit him up every time they brought him in. So this, and now back to your you know, local listening stations. Well, geez, the club boss went berserk. Don Were they all Grant, in on it? Nobody, Except for no, Seaver? Only me and oh. Jack 
Simon knew about it. I didn't tell anybody. But now Don Grant huffs out of the club. Was, what station was that? What station was that? You know, and boom, he's out. And now Seaver Stanner, just like he'd seen a ghost, just dumbfounded. And I go up to Seaver. I stand by the training room, just observing everything, so I can see everything. I go up to Seaver and I put my hand out, and he didn't want to shake my hand. I just I'll left shake it, it there. Good to see you. I, I just left it there, and he finally reached up and he grabbed just the end of my fingers like this, you know, just a cold fish shake. I, I said, I can't believe they did this, you know, and I just really sympathized with them. And I saw Ed Crane pulled over there, beating the locker with his <laughs> bat, and I mean. People were shocked, and uh, so I hurry up and got Jack Simon. I says, "Hey, get the hell out of here, and don't say a word to nobody. They'll hang us out in the next <laughs> light pole out here." We never said a word to nobody. That was it. I don't know what people. I did ask questions about it. I don't know what people did. I'm sure the Mets made a hundred phone calls. Well, a few years later, Seaver gets traded to Cincinnati, and uh, I'm pitching against him. He beats me four to two the first game. Next time we match up, I beat him four to two. And we hit doubles off each other. <laughs> but anyway, after the first game, Kiner has us both on Kiner's corner. And so Kiner's sitting here, I'm sitting here, Seaver's sitting to my right. And we're in our uniforms, in the Cincinnati uniform. And Kiner says, Coos, you know, uh, you guys played together for over 10 years. You must have some good stories that you could probably reminisce and tell us about. So I told this story. Now, this is the first time Seaver heard it, that he really knew what oh, happened. Oh, he didn't know that you were behind he it until didn't then? No, didn't know. Just some years later. Now, there's monitors in the TV room, and you can see, you know, they had the camera close up on me, so he could see that. So he gets right up here where he's not in the picture, and he's going, you dumb, <laughs> just tossing <laughs> me out, whispering to me in my ear like this. <laughs> well, that was the first time he found out about it. So the bottom line is you were ahead of your time because it was years <laughs> later that Tom was traded to the Cincinnati Reds from when you pulled that prank. But not only yeah. was Jerry Kuzman ahead of his time, he was a Met for all time. The winningest pitcher and the greatest big game pitcher in the history of the New York Mets. It's been an absolute pleasure to visit with you on one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Thanks for the build-up. You got it. Jerry <laughs> Kuzman, our guest. I'm Howie Rose. We'll see you next time.